Bienvenidos al Instituto Cervantes de Nueva Delhi. Los que están aquí con nosotros de una forma presencial y los que estáis al otro lado de la pantalla de una forma virtual. Espero que algún día esa virtualidad se traslade en presencialidad. Muchas gracias por estar todos aquí con, con nosotros. Es realmente un gran placer para el Instituto Cervantes de Nueva Delhi ser parte junto con Sydney, Toulouse, Dakar y Chicago de esta segunda edición de Benengeli, Encuentros Literarios Mundiales de Literatura en Español. En realidad, estos encuentros promueven el diálogo entre autores en lengua española y autores en otras lenguas, como es el caso aquí hoy. Y me gustaría, antes que nada, agradecer a, a Nicolás Melini, comisario de este encuentro, a Juan Carlos Méndez, técnico de literatura en la sede, a Martí Basset, nuestro gestor cultural, y muy especialmente, evidentemente, a nuestros, a nuestros invitados. En primer lugar, Eduardo Halfón, que nos habla desde, desde Berlín. Decir que Eduardo es un escritor guatemalteco, premio nacional de literatura en su país, y que también recientemente ha ganado el premio Cálamo Extraordinario por su novela Canción. Me ha sorprendido porque Eduardo se define a sí mismo como judío y árabe a la vez. Una hermosa contradicción. Y seguro que también como hispano y gringo, y por su vida errante, creo que es un ciudadano, un ciudadano del mundo, ha vivido en muchas partes, ¿no? Y creo que escribe desde esa posición privilegiada que da el ser un eterno extranjero. Muchas gracias, Eduardo, por estar aquí con nosotros. Es también un gran placer tener aquí a Gitanjali Shri, nuestra escritora que escribe en hindi y por lo tanto ponemos en conversación estas dos lenguas. Y Gitanjali Shri se crió en varias ciudades de Uttar Pradesh y Uttar Pradesh es el meollo de la India. Se encuentra en la cuenca gangética y es la cuna del hindi, la lengua con la que ella escribe. Ella saltó a la fama por su traducción inglesa de Maí y ahora, recientemente, su novela Red Samadhi, que quiere decir tumba de arena, ha sido seleccionada para el Booker Prize del 2022, lo cual realmente es un honor extraordinario. Y me gustaría también presentar a Lipi Bisbas, profesora de la Jawahal Nehru University, y Lipi que realmente está en el centro de esta actividad, porque gracias a ella hemos conocido a Gitanjali Shri. Y la buena noticia es que Lipi está traduciendo la novela Mai de Gitanjali Shri al español. Muchas gracias, Lipi, por tu labor gracias. de moderación y por introducirnos a estos extraordinarios escritores en hindi. Finalmente, ya para acabar, decir que este segundo encuentro Benengeli gira en torno al tema del realismo. Y yo espero, en realidad, que sea una aproximación heterodoxa al realismo. Porque, más allá de la cuestión de estilos, para mí una de las grandes preguntas en torno al realismo es ¿por qué tan a menudo nos parece que la ficción es más auténtica que la realidad? Y quizás puede ser que la realidad sea ficción y que la literatura, la ficción de la ficción, sea verdaderamente real. En todo caso, Lipi, tienes la palabra. Los escritores nos lo van a decir mucho mejor y que empiece el debate. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, doctor Pujol, y siempre, y Martí y Nicolás, y sobre todo a Eduardo y Gitangeli, por haberme dado este espacio, por having given me the space and the time in which uh, I prepared for this and all, both of you were so quick with your answers. That was a pleasure to go through. And thanks to both of you and thanks to this uh, festival, I actually read another author. I mean, it's like uh, reading Eduardo's novels were an eye opener because we know all of our students are working with Guatemalan literature, but the other side of it. So thank you very much for having written those books to both of you, both Gitanjali and Eduardo. So without much ado, I would like to start. There are simple questions that I had prepared. 
just to you know kind of find out what is where we are coming from with the reality or realism so my first question to you eduardo is what inspired you to write fiction and why do you only write novels and short stories um well first first of all ante todo muchas gracias lo diré en español porque tengo que agradecer al al instituto cervantes eh y al 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 a todo el festival por por la invitación eh aunque sea de lejos pero estoy 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 ahí de cerca metaphorically and literally. And now I'll switch to English because this is going to be a lot easier if we, if we speak in English. Um, so that's, that's a very good question, Dipi. Um, I think in my case, the genre chose me. Um, and and, and I, would, I would even say that I don't write novels. I only write stories. Uh, I feel very, very comfortable in the 100 meter dash. Yeah, that's that's my 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 preferred uh, event. My preferred extension is that of the short story. It's a very different beast, you know, than the novel or than and then a short story has has a different intensity. It has a different intentionality. Um, whether it be a story of of a page, which I have, or a story of a hundred pages. Uh, in, in my opinion, I, I still write them in the same way, in the same, in the same, uh, with the same intensity. You know, I want the reader to to read them with the same intensity. That is, in one reading, one one slap, so to speak. Yeah. Um, the, the 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 trick is in in the commercial world, in the publishing world, stories are not. Um, very welcome let's say you know they, they the, the the myth is that stories don't sell uh novels sell so so most publishers not all but most publishers want novels in my case this seems right. to work very well because my stories are or can be uh chapters they can be put together as chapters in 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 a sort of novel, or to, to put it another way, uh, episodes, uh, an episodic novel. And this happens because of the narrator. I think this is the key. We were talking a bit before we, we started the event. Uh, it's the same narrator. It's this, this one voice, one man, also named Eduardo Halfon, who has my, my bio, who has my beard, uh, but who is not me. He has his own personality. He smokes a lot. I don't smoke. Uh, he travels well. I don't travel well anymore. Uh, we are very different, but it's the same person. It's the same voice in all of these stories that I've been writing since the publication of The Polish Boxer in, in 2008. Uh, it's now six books in, in, in this sort of series of his episodes, of his stories, no? Um, so then they can be seen as novels and they can be read as novels as well if, if the reader so chooses. But, but it's, not, it's not something that I chose. I just, I just began writing this way um, almost 20 years ago now. When I, when I fell into literature, because I fell into this, I, 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 didn't, I didn't start here. You know, I'm an engineer. I studied engineering. And I was telling Gitanjali before we started, I was not even a reader growing up. I found literature late, quote unquote late, um, and quite by accident. And when I started writing eventually, uh, I just began in this fashion. Not only in this blend of story and novel, and, but also, um, why does my narrator have my name? What, what, what am I trying to accomplish by fooling the reader into thinking it's real to use the word we're supposed to use today. Now, is it real? Do they read it as real? Do they read it as autobiography, although it's sold as fiction? Uh, it's just the way I began. I, I, there was never a, a conscious decision-making process. I never, I never thought to myself, well, how do I want to write? Do I want to write short or long? Do I want to write fiction or non? 
it's just all the same to me. And it just it just presented itself in that way. Thank you, Eduardo. Gitanjali, the same question to you. Well, thank you, Lippi, and thank you, Institute Cervantes, where I'm here, where I've come for the first time, and I hope not the last time. Um, it's wonderful to be here, and it's wonderful to have this chance to interact with um, both of you. Um, well, to get to the question, um, I'm I'm always a little amazed at how so many writers say somehow similar things. What uh, Eduardo, you just said about not choosing your uh, genre, but being uh, chosen by it in some sense is exactly what I feel about, you know, my, the form I have made mine or uh, that I'm working mostly in. Um, the other thing that you said, I mean, I, I, I was just thinking, you said you, you were not even a reader and you were an engineer and literature came to you late. There, I disagree a little because I think formal literature may have come to you late, but stories come to us from the word go. You know, we are born with stories, we are surrounded by stories, we want to tell stories, we see, hear, smell stories, everything is a story, the world is a story. So we are living with stories and we love stories right from the start. And uh, why, uh, I mean, how do we, how do some of us decide that storytelling is going to be their mode of um, interacting with the world, interacting with themselves and expressing themselves? And why do some become engineers and dancers? I mean, that's that's again a matter of some chance and being chosen by different forms of expression to uh, to be able to experience, to be able to voice their experience, to be able to say something about their experience. So I also just uh, fell into storytelling and uh, and everything inspired me. I mean, the world inspired me. Everything was about stories, but why? I mean, again, I'm repeating what you said that, you know, uh, whether it's going to be a long form, whether it's going to be a short form was nothing that was deliberated and pre-decided, you know, the, uh, the story decided it and it happened. What I find in the course of writing in all these years is that I, unlike you, prefer the novel. Now, why I can't really tell. You like the tautness of the story. You like the, um, you used the word, the intensity of it. I think I like the vast terrain that the novel uh, permits me. I like the, um, you know, the, the kinds of tragic trees, the kinds of, you know, uh, turns left and right and circuitous and so on that it allows me. There's a word in Hindi, bhatakna, mm. you know, wandering. Uh, wandering. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I love the, that yeah. uh, quality, that uh, possibility in the novel. Mm. And it is, it is actually not uh, just um, um, uh, wandering and I in some completely uh, irrational and um, mad manner. It may look so, but it isn't, you know, you have to, it, it, you have somewhere, you know, it um, acquires a shape and it comes together. But the terrain is so wonderful and vast and I love that. So that's how Neander novel through, became, yeah, novel Neander became through the story. my main Lippi, can I, can I, can I, can I uh, uh, sure. answer yeah, uh, Gitanjali? I think you're absolutely right, Gitanjali. I think I think um, stories are with us from childhood on. Yeah. You know? uh, storytelling, uh, living through stories, and and I remember two very specific. I've I've two very specific memories of 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 childhood and stories. One one that I'd like to tell, and one that I'd forgotten until recently, until I had my son, and my son triggered the memory. I had forgotten this memory. And it was the first time I received in, in the mid seventies as a gift, a camera. I received a, a, a one click, you know, one of these one click cameras. I was maybe seven or eight years old. And uh, I wanted to tell a story with it. I had this story in my head 
that I wanted to tell through photos. And, and so I went outside. We had a sand lot in the, in the backyard and I took my soldiers. This was in the middle of the Guatemalan Civil War. So I think the soldier idea here is kind of important mm -hmm. because I, I, I kept hearing bombings. I kept seeing military personnel and guerrillas. And so I had all these images in my head and I knew the story I wanted to tell. And I took photos of these little soldiers, these to toy soldiers in the sand lot. And I was thrilled. And I ran inside and I gave the, 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 the roll of film to my mother and she went off and had it developed. And about a week later, my mom comes back and she's furious. She's furious. And she throws the photos on my bed and she says, what a waste. And I was, I remember the sense of being absolutely confused as to a waste of what? I didn't, I, I didn't understand what she meant. Was this a waste of film, a waste of imagination, a waste of a story? I don't know. And I still don't know because she threw them away. But I had the idea of telling stories, we, as, as we all do, listening to stories and telling stories ever since I was very young. When I say I came into literature late, you're correct. The, the form. You know, I became a reader late. I was in my late 20s when I, when I stumbled into reading. Um, and I became a reader, just a reader, uh, and I, you know, a new reader, which implies anarchy and, and just literature as a drug almost. I couldn't get enough. I couldn't get enough books. I couldn't get enough fiction. I couldn't get enough stories without ever thinking of becoming a writer. That just didn't enter into my reality. Yeah. Um, after a couple of years of so much reading, of filling myself up with books, the overflow was writing. Writing for me was just a consequence of too much reading. Uh, you know, let, let, let me try. And I began trying in a language I didn't dominate anymore in Spanish. Yeah. Uh, when I should have, when I should have began in English, I began in Spanish. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. There's a difference between storytelling and the the the, the this irrational job we have of of writing. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add something else? No, I think. So I'll go fine. on to the next question. Gitanjali, I'll start with you. What constitutes reality <laughs> for you? How do you perceive reality? And what makes you decide which part of this reality to write about? Um, Lippi, you ask this question as if it's a very simple question. <laughs> it's... It's absolutely the worst possible question. <laughs> I mean, I think philosophers have um, forever, you know, um, tangled with it and not said anything convincing. What is reality and what can a sort of poor writer like me, you know, say about it, which is, um, you know, going to uh, teach us anything. So I, I, I wouldn't even... I won't even try. I, I just don't dare. But um, I mean, again, this sounds a bit uh, rhetorical, but I think uh, anything and everything would constitute reality for me. Even imagination is a reality. Um, even just illusion is a reality. And that is how I go along. What What is it that, what part of reality would I write about? Um, I, I'm trying to guess, and I think that part, which is not the what is considered too easily and very obviously reality, mm -hmm. you know, this very physical, very tangible, very much right here, mm -hmm. this is real and this is reality. I don't think that interests me very much. Mm -hmm. I, I believe there is a lot of deception there, mm -hmm. and that there is something which is lying behind it, something lying which is hidden, something which is uh, subterranean, something which is more unconscious, subconscious, elusive. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm interested in catching that. Mm -hmm. So that's the part I try to get to. I cannot be sure how much of it I'm going to get, but you know, if you like, you know, in the novel Mai, yeah. um, the whole search is for the real mind yes. you know now which is again that is about um, reality you know where, where does my's reality lie in this woman who is bent and looks uh, completely oppressed and looks like she's surrounded by all the oppressors mm -hmm. 
or in places where we have not been able to see Mai. Yes. Is that where the real Mai is or her reality is? So the whole book becomes a search for reality and ultimately maybe, I mean as I'm speaking on, I think maybe reality is not something there but reality is something we are all trying to gauge, trying to reach. It's the meaning we are trying to find and it's something which we're just reaching out to and never going to actually gotcha. catch. A mirage. Yeah, yeah. A yeah. A that's mirage. it. Eduardo, that's it, I think, <laughs> for the moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Eduardo, the same question <laughs> for you. So what constitutes reality for you? How do you preserve reality and what makes you decide which part of this reality to write about? You're right, Gitanjali. This is this is such a such a. I don't know if it's it's a hard question. It's just probably not the the right question to ask a writer. It's it's more it's of a question for, for, for. It's a cruel question. You're <laughs> right. You're right. You're putting us on the spot, which is always good, Lippi, <laughs> because we're forced to to think about things we 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 don't want to think about or or to put into words uh, uh, something we refuse to put into words. Um, by our, on, on, on our own, but your questions, what they what they trigger in me is a sort of a a, a a response is a different type of question. So, what is the difference between reality and truth? That's the first thing because in Spanish, I'm always asked, "Es verdad?" Is it true? Is what you write is, is what you write true, or is it real? Two different questions. Two different questions, um, and 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 we've used today also the word autentico. No, is it authentic? Mm -hmm. So those three three words that are really interesting. In my case, um, I intentionally try to fool the reader into thinking, or trick the reader, or seduce the reader, whatever word you want to use, into thinking that what they're reading is absolutely real. Right. So my grandfather was at Auschwitz. My other grandfather was from everything I, I, I put into these stories, which I intentionally tell you are fiction. This is all fiction. We, we're going to sign a contract when you buy the book. You're going to buy it as fiction. I'm going to sell it as fiction. We've signed a contract. And by page five, they've forgotten that contract because the reality I'm giving them is so similar to the reality they think my life is, their, their, their way of reading changes. Their way of reading changes. And they'll read these stories as truth, which is, I think, a better word for what we do in, in, in fiction. Um, so, so my job then, as you get touched, I'm thinking out loud here. I'm, I'm trying to come up with, it, with, 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 with an answer. What my job is as a writer to set the stage as convincingly as possible. Yeah? You have to think that, that that stage is real. So my backdrop, the props, everything I do is just um, a device for you to enter that world and think it's a real world. And it's not. We know this is an artifice. We know it's fiction, but we enter anyways. Yeah. And once you're in, then truth becomes important. But why does truth become important? And here I'm using the word truth very, very delicately. And I'm not using truth as, as a truth, but as a, what Werner Herzog referred to as an ecstatic truth. So a truth of ecstasy, a, an emotional truth, not a rational truth. There's, this is not a... a, a a, a, a political pamphlet I'm trying to write here, but an emotional truth that I want to share. Yeah. And if you enter my world, this painted world, this, this made up world, and you suddenly think it's a real world, then the emotional truth or the, 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 the visceral aspect of it will be stronger. The reaction to it will be stronger. And I think that 
my readers in, 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 in this sense become children because they don't doubt anymore if it's real or not. It's absolutely real. You know, the, the, the little rabbit flew and uh, Santa Claus exists and et cetera, et cetera. So they become um, as involved um, in the story without questioning it, without doubting it. Yeah, and I was also <clears throat> thinking of the fact that your character is Eduardo Halfon. So that really helps. In that, the, that's that's part of the trick. In the seduction. In the, and I'm telling, but, but, but Lipi, I'm telling you it's a trick. I'm telling, I, I tell my readers, this is, I could have named him Juan Perez. Yeah, and, and made him have hair. <laughs> right? But I, I intentionally lend him my name, give him my image. Do you know where this comes from? And this will go back to, to what we were talking about before, Gitanjali, about how we, it chooses us. My first book, uh, which, which is now almost 20 years old, is a very, very, very small book. It's, it was 40 pages long, and it's called Saturno, so Saturn. And it, it's, it was, uh, I wrote it very, very quickly. It's written in second person. It's a letter to a father. Very Kafkaesque. It's a, it's a letter to a, to, a, to a dominant, overbearing, abusive father. By, written by a narrator or told by a narrator who was obsessed with suicide writers and the role each father played in that suicide. And he's telling his father everything. You know? This narrator looks a lot like me, but doesn't have my name yet. And the, the, the father in the book looks a lot like my father. Mm -hmm. Okay. And slowly, as you read this long letter, which is very, very over the top, it's, 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 he's yelling at his father. He's becoming more and more um, uh, crazy. Yeah, you can tell he's he's falling into some kind of dark hole. The narrator and getting closer himself to suicide. You can feel this as you read. And I wrote this. This book, by the way, is still forbidden in my family. I can't even talk about this book in my family. Uh, at the end of the book, you find out the father is dead. So it's a letter to a dead father. My father is alive, but I, but I sort of killed him in the book. And my point is this. When the first review came out, the title of the review in the, in the main Guatemala newspaper was, we have to save Halfon. So the reviewer, I was shocked to learn, thought that the narrator was me and just read it absolutely literally. And they had to save me. And I loved it. I loved the feeling of the reader not questioning it anymore. And so from then on, I gave him my name. I turned up the volume in this little game and just gave him my name. And that's how I started. But, but I never thought about it. I never questioned why. I, I just started writing this way. And it has to do with, with, with truth, I think and the way I, I want a reader to, to, to enter. And I think what Gitanjali just said, to get to that intangible, almost visible, but not quite the shadow behind, and not be taken in by very uh, obvious images mm -hmm. which are there, mm -hmm. to try and go behind that, yeah, you know, the mirror yeah, images, yeah. talk about mirrors and illusions, and then try and... And also, I think to some extent, to involve the reader also in the writing, you know. Yeah. So, you know, as I was telling Gitanjali when I was reading her novels, they remind me, reminded me of various characters I may or may not have known. So I think, you know, that that, that this game is fantastic. Please keep playing it, both of you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's also a game that we constantly play in life yes. where fact and fiction are so close Absolutely. together that... You know, it's uh, just amazing that um, this character has my name and my face, yeah. but is not me. Is not. You know, somehow it's a very, uh, it's some very uh, poignant um, locus, yes. you know. And it, I think uh, it does something quite magical. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. it does. So, so I start with you now, Eduardo. How do you decide which language you write? Mm -hmm. in, 
because you are between Spanish and English, Gitanjali yeah. is between Hindi and English. So yes. how do you decide? Okay. I, I, again, it was not a decision. It just I just started in Spanish. And, and in my case, we were speaking a little bit before the, the event about this. Um, it just happened that way. Uh, uh, so when I, when, I, when I was 28, I'll go back to that moment. You know, and I was reading. I was back in Guatemala. I left Guatemala when I was 10. We left. We fled with my family. Um, and I grew up in, in, in the United States. And English immediately displaced Spanish. Immediately. I mean, it wasn't even a, a, a weeks. You know, because that's what you do as a kid. You just, uh, if you want to fit in, if you want friends, you start speaking like they speak, dressing like they dress. So it was a survival thing. I, yeah. We immediately let go of Spanish. Mm -hmm. Our parents would speak to us in Spanish, but we would answer in English. And so when I went back to Guatemala after the university, this was you know, 12 or 13 years later, I could barely speak Spanish. Um, I could understand it. I spoke it very poorly uh, with a heavy accent. And I had to start slowly recovering my, my, my mother tongue. You know? uh, five years later, uh, after much frustration, I, was, I, I didn't want to be in Guatemala. I didn't want to be in Spanish. I was completely desubicado, decimos en español. Mis, out of place, Ketanjali, but out of place more than physically. So spiritually, mentally, I was just completely... Um, lost, you no. Know? And now I know that th those years in anybody's life are of crisis. You know, now you have to decide: what do you want to do? Where do you want to live? What, what do you want to work as? Um, in my case, it was perhaps accentuated by the language aspect. I, I just I, I didn't understand Spanish anymore, and I that frustration is what pushed me into one day going to the university and wanting to take philosophy courses. I thought that maybe philosophy would, would help me with this existential crisis. And in Guatemala, I don't know how it is in, in India, but in Guatemala, it's a joint degree. It's called Letras y Filosofía. So, so literature and philosophy. And, and the lady at admissions said, if you want to study, if you want to enroll in philosophy classes, you have to also enroll in literature. I was forced. And I immediately fell in love with literature. Immediately. Uh, with stories, basically. And when I started writing, I started in Spanish. I was back in Guatemala. I had, I had fallen into literature in Spanish. I don't know the reason why, uh, but I have a, a very nice theory of why I began in Spanish. And it's not any of the ones I've, I've said. Um, and it's not that it was my mother tongue, but that it was my childhood tongue. So my childhood, those first 10 years were spent in Spanish. And you've read me, Deepi, you know how important that is when I write. I keep going back there. I keep right. going back to the 70s yeah. and, and finding clues and finding stories. And when I met my grandfather, it's all there. And that was in Spanish. Uh, recently, I've been writing more and more in English, uh, which in, in a sub-question of your question then is what happens with my translations? because I. They, they are translations into English. They're not written in English. Um, and I was telling you before, they begin in my head in English because I'm still thinking in English when I write. But the words, for some reason, fall on the page in Spanish. There's this simultaneous act of translation while I write from English to Spanish. Uh, and then they have to find their way back to English by somebody else. And that's a problem. Or it can be a problem. And we were talking about a very, a very interesting point that all your translation have an X added chapter, which is not there in the original. They have yeah. something. So it's almost like transcreating the novel, you know, literally creating the novel again. So again, part of yeah. it is a translation, but the part of it yeah. is like an extra, which makes yeah. it stand out from its original. An extra or a subtraction, because there's some publishers that take, take stories out. For example, the French... Um, translation of the Polish boxer uh, has only two stories. It's a 50 page volume, beautiful. They just wanted the two stories that dealt with specifically with my grandfather in Auschwitz. And it's a beautiful edition. But the Japanese or the Dutch version of the Polish boxer um, are three books in one. 
So, you know, 300 page books of many more stories. And in each, each case, I have to, I do the table of contents. I put them in order. And depending on what is the content, I have to change a few things, mm-hmm. add a line, uh, change a title. Um, so yes, in every language that these stories are, are, are traveling to, um, they become absolutely original editions. We'll see what happens in Hindi. Yes. It'll, it'll, if, someday. So someday. Someday soon. Mm-hmm. Gitanjali, the same question to you. How do you decide which language to write your novels in? Well, I can see, we, uh, I mean, the language question is so um, thoroughly embroiled in our histories. Uh, I mean, uh, not just the individual history, I'm talking of our, uh, the history of uh, our people yes. you know, as a c- larger community and the country. So, um, in my case, I mean, Lippi, you would know it very well that uh, Hindi and English, I mean, it's because of our great colonial past yes. that we have this very skewed relationship and uh, we've grown up in. Uh, I'm talking, I mean, everyone, everyone has grown up with English and their mother tongue. Mm. And um, people from my area, the cow belt, have grown up uh, with Hindi and English. Um, Not in a neat uh, division that perhaps Eduardo is uh, talking about, where you say you can speak, you you think in uh, English and you write in Spanish. I don't think it's so neatly divided in us. I think it's much more of a hodgepodge, Mm. which we really have to untangle. I think it's, uh, in some sense, uh, our history um, has taken away both languages from us Mm. because it's made such a um, hodgepodge of the two in our heads but um, and i mean i often uh, say this i mean it's uh, anyone who's educated in india anyone who can converse in english Mm. they would almost never imagine that such a person would write in anything but english English. so it comes as a you know, always this great amazement, you know, they'll ask me, why are you writing in Hindi? Mm. And I say, do you realize what a strange question that is to ask me why I'm writing in my mother tongue and not in a foreign language? language. I mean, you find that strange? So surely there's something very strange in our, uh, in the way we look at things. So, uh, so we have this very strange uh, relationship with language. Now, Hindi and English I've grown up in, And I thought for a long time that the language I knew better was English. But I think again, going back to things not only happening when you formally register for them, you know. Uh, So formally, I was uh, educated in English. But informally, I was receiving a lot of Hindi education. So I was not cut off from Hindi. And I sometimes think that I was uh, uh, receiving a better Hindi education because I was... Uh, getting educated at many registers, you know, mm-hmm. the street language, the spoken language, mm-hmm. the classical language, the language of, you know, it was uh, the years, um, free India was still a new country mm-hmm. when I was uh, mm-hmm. born and growing up. It was still a new country. There was a lot of idealism about um, India and its literature. I mean, a lot of that has unfortunately, you know, taken a back seat now. Mm-hmm. So, so in the towns, uh, where I grew up in my childhood, um, Hindi literature, the Hindi poets, the Hindi writers, they were still a revered um, set of people. So all that I was picking up, um, I mean, that I was getting informally. The schools I, w- I was going to were English medium and I was picking up English out there. So really, in some strange way, both the languages were growing in me. Mm. And when finally I did decide in my when I was... Um, in my 20s that you know it's absolutely now time i have to write this is my main vocation and uh, i must start writing now i had an initial period of uh, wondering which should be my language and then i think what uh, again just um, made the choice for me was what you said that it's the language of your childhood you know yes. and that's why it's called the mother tongue, mother you know? tongue. yeah so so it's 
I have no, I, I have nothing against English. Mm. I mean, I don't like the hierarchy between yes. the two languages. Yes. There's no reason for one to be considered yeah. superior and the other Absolutely. to be considered the language of the, Absolutely. you know, riffraff or yeah, uh, yeah. and so on. But uh, apart from that, I do not have any problem with English and I would very happily try my hand uh, you know, at English writing and uh, see what I can write. I mean, I'm very free about that. But um, there was this intuitive sense, you know, that uh, to capture those, uh, ultimately, I mean, sorry, I'm just uh, mm -hmm. uh, going back a little. I'm, ultimately, what we are writing is also um, all based on memory. Yes. You know, even if we are writing just immediately, you know, something we've seen right now and we write it, already it's a memory when we write it, yeah? So I think when you're trying to uh, recreate those memories, then you need the language in which you smelt it, yes. the language in which you saw it, heard it, all those flavors were coming to me in Hindi. Mm -hmm. And quite automatically, Hindi became the natural choice. Mm -hmm. So, in, it wasn't an intellectual decision at all. It was completely an in, intuitive decision. Mm -hmm. Later, when I became aware about the implications of having chosen Hindi, mm -hmm. when it looked like I could also have chosen English, mm -hmm. I was very pleased with myself mm -hmm. that I had chosen Hindi. Right. And also, I discovered as I went along that um, a lot of Hindi was already there inside me. I didn't know it. Mm. So the more I started reading and writing in it, the more it started coming out. And I was quite amazed, you know, how much uh, Hindi I already had, you know, coursing mm. in my blood. Yeah. Initially, I think um, the, uh, some, some could say, especially those who are purists, mm. would say that my Hindi was not, uh, this is not Hindi. Even now, some people would say that, you know, this is not Hindi because they have a certain uh, conventional, uh, um, you know, uh, world of Hindi in mind, a language in uh, mind. It was invented. And, yeah, but um, I think that disadvantage of not knowing conventional Hindi, not being conventionally educated in Hindi served me well and became my advantage because it freed me. It gave me a freedom I would not have had if I had had a traditional upbringing in Hindi. And it made me, um, uh, I think, um, adventurous. It made me adventurous. It made me adventurous. It made me experimental. Mm -hmm. It made me borrow very happily and easily. Yes. It may, gave me an eclectic tongue. Mm -hmm. It made me pluralistic. It made me polyphonic. It made me all those things which we consider you know, values that we really revere and mm -hmm. live with and want to um, uh, take forward, if anything, in today's world. So I think this not having a conventional education served me well in Hindi and I, I write in this very mixed mm -hmm. Hindi, which is um, good, yeah. <laughs> fine. No, and I feel yeah. that I connect better with Gitanjali's Hindi works as opposed to the very correct Hindi in other things because she writes the way we in the metropolis speak. We are mixing. I'm a Bengali. So I'll have a, you know, one sentence will be punctuated with Bengali, Hindi, English, depending on whom you're speaking with. Or when you're in a rage, the language which is easiest that comes out or when you're in a different mode. And I think that's why one connects better to Gitanjali's uh, words. And I found your writing also easy to connect with. That I connected immediately, you know, I mean, when... Kansion starts with the whole story of your grandfather and this thing and I somehow connected and it reminded me of various places I had visited and you know imagined so I connected easily so I think that is a very important part of this reality that we are talking about that how do you write we talk in one way but if we write in another way who are we writing for you know that then becomes the question, who are we writing for? That's why when I started uh, working on Gitanjali's novels, I found it easy because in her novels, in one sentence, you have Bengali, you have Punjabi, you have English, you have hybrid English words, guarantee wali. You mm. know, that is hybrid word, you know. And uh, I remember that uh, particular part in Amara Shahar Uzbaras, 
where they are coming out of the cinema hall and the punjabi says oh e bada changa lage tha bada sonya lage tha and then the he says babu wash i don't cry so mm. tum bhalo so you know those languages the punjabi and the bengali are jostling and that's pretty much how we you know are growing up i mean that's the way i have grown up that's the way my daughter is growing up my students come from different linguistic areas and we all you know are coming to spanish so these things not to have that boundary because these they have to be porous mm-hmm. and you know if you don't have that possibility open then books become stilted then the stories don't reach as you said they don't you know like the sirens beguile you and into thinking the reality it is that which both your books that i had i was very fortunate to start reading your novel cancion which i pretty much finished almost at one go and gitanjali's novels which i have been working with for a couple of years is that i related to the language even as a spanish teacher as not a native speaker i could relate to the spanish that you were writing it flowed easily for me and with gitanjali is the same thing with the hindi and the other languages coming you relate and that's where i think is both your talents that you can reel us in very easily you know and i think the, we have to break borders hmm. those borders if we don't break borders then you know it's life won't be worth I, living i agree with you lippy and just two quick things about what you said uh in 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 my case and i was very happy to hear gitanjali about the, this this uh way of letting other languages into your hindi there's a lot of english in my spanish there there's a lot of english it's unavoidable i don't do it on purpose it's not that i want to yeah. but uh sentence structure comma placement the use of adverbs which is much more prevalent in english than in spanish in spanish they're heavy uh there's all these quirks that i have that i bring from english yeah. and which make my own private spanish so to speak it's it's my way of of my relationship with spanish is my writing you know it's it's this it's this relationship you have with your language mm-hmm. uh and the the, the idea lippy that you're saying of 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 I I I don't remember the word you used but of 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 uh going into my writing or that I think there's two things I want it to read testimony yeah, yeah. so the, there's no uh gatage there's no quotes in dialogues there's no italics when there's words in other languages mm-hmm. so visually yeah. it it looks like a testimonial it it sounds like a testimony the sound of it is to me really important the music of these words mm-hmm. uh and it takes me a long time to get it that way it it feels effortless after 2 years of of just the the craft of it yes so i'll write a first draft very quickly they're very short but then i can spend one or two years just getting the language to feel seamless yes. uh and i think that's what you what you felt when you read it in yeah. spanish it just flowed and with gitanjali also it flows because that's the way we talk that's the way we talk. that's the way we talk we don't talk in a sanskritized hindi you know and that's the way and that's why i feel the reality that we are talking about which is so intangible this is one of the things which really uh, helps a reader come closer to reading and we were just talking about how people are not reading enough and it is it, uh, it is these strategies you know which help us uh, read connect understand and follow i mean even in my i mean we start with the daughter sunaina who is relating the story is the narrator about her mother who needs to stand up she feels she needs to stand up for her rights and you start thinking like that but by the end of the novel you are into mine you see the little you know ellipses the little spaces the little shadows because nothing can be really put in black and white because life is in black and white is not in black and white mm-hmm. so to expect that i think that's that's what the most interesting thing i found about both your writings is the way they flowed into me it was even the reading 
was kind of uh, effortless because you were so, we, we are so immersed in what you're writing. It becomes truly real. And from here is my next question to you, Gitanjali. Mm. How do you decide which literary strategies to use to tell your story, right? What helps you decide how to real, you know, how to narrate the story which you feel has to be put, has to come out? Uh, I'll try not to give a very long answer to this and not get all long-winded. Um, I don't think I decide. I think the story decides. I think, uh, in fact, there's a there's a great poet, A.K. Ramanujan, you know, mm. and I can't remember his exact, um, I can't quote exactly, but he had said somewhere, I think it's somewhere in his diary, that he doesn't go chasing a poem, he doesn't go pursuing the poem, mm. he puts himself in a place mm. where he's receptive, and he waits for the poem to come to him. Oh. So, uh, so it's it's I mean it's yeah. a, it's not an exact quote, no, but that's, that's what uh, it, it's uh, in the, uh, that's what he's saying. So I think what a writer does is really something like that. I mean things are happening. I mean they they they're in us all the time. It's no, there's a certain way we are responding to the world. We are responding to the things that are happening around us, things that are troubling us, making us happy, etc., etc. They're just going on in us all the time. And you have to find your space and the moment and know where to... Something will come and you will start, you'll begin it. So you wait for that. You place yourself in that kind of uh, position and situation. And uh, the muse comes. Uh -huh. yeah. And the muse sees you are now right for it. And you lift your pen and you start something. It doesn't work while you're still trying, mm -hmm. trying, trying. It only begins to work when it acquires its, begins to acquire its own personality, its own yeah. tone, its own gait, mm. its own character. When that begins to happen, then you know you've got it and now you have to keep going and then you go together. It takes you on, you take it on and you know the story takes you along, you take the story along, the characters decide no they have to turn left now and you have to go left and so on so forth. It carries on and strategies evolve from within that dynamic. So there'll be a different strategy, perhaps in different writings, unless you talk of something, you know, like like um, Eduardo's, that he has the same narrator with the same um, uh, name each time, and um, it might seem to be him, but it's not him. Mm -hmm. So you know, something has become like a signature. Yeah, but. Uh, that's, I think, uh, that's only something very obvious. Mm -hmm. Actually, the strategy will be um, somewhere in the dynamic of the work and it will evolve from there. Yeah, Thank you. that's what I would say. Eduardo, the same question for you. How do you decide which literary strategies to use to tell your story and what helps you decide how to narrate the story within you? Can I, can, can I just quote? Yes, please. It's it's, yes. it's it's the same answer. I would have said it in, in different <laughs> words, but it's 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 absolutely the same answer. You would quote me. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna quote. I'm gonna paraphrase you. Yes, it's the same answer. It's it's the hardest thing, you know, Libby, for me when I began writing as an engineer. I, I'm very much an engineer. Um, whether I studied that or not, my way of uh, seeing the world. Uh, very neurotic, very organized, very, very plan oriented. So the hardest thing for a story writer to learn was to know that you're not in control. Mm -hmm. It's the story that's going to tell you where it needs to go. Always, always. Even if you have certain notions, um, you have to learn how to relax. It's, it's another way of saying what you said, Gitanji. You know, just, just put yourself in a position in an open position, uh, don't 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 fixate on one point. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because the story will want to go somewhere else and you have to let it and go with it. Um, and so even though my narrator is always the same, the strategy, the, the, the technique, um, the time sequence, it all depends on each particular story. You almost have to relearn how to write for that story and, and, and figure it out. And that only comes, as Borges used to say, he, I don't believe in, in, in inspiration, uh, but if a, such a thing exists, it only comes when you're sitting down. Just sit down and do the work. And then things will happen and the story will play itself out and it'll take you into, into places you never even imagined you, could, you would go. Uh, so that surprise for me as a writer is, is the most wonderful thing, the scariest thing, because you don't know what you're doing while you're doing it. Yeah. You don't know what you're writing about. You don't know where you're headed, uh, if it's far away or close. Mm -hmm. uh, endings usually surprise me. They sneak up on me. And I, and I know once I've written the scene that that's the ending. Uh, so it's, 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 it's the same answer, <laughs> just said in, in, in different words. Yeah. Yeah. Besides, we intellectuals and critiques have to have something to work on. You can't have all the answers. We have to do our job and look for it. So I think that's you, have a you have a different protocol. Yes, so. different way yeah. probably mm -hmm. trying to. We are also trying to get to that intangible mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. which we find in your stories. So that's mm -hmm. work to us as well. So I would like to kind of end with this question and then I would like to request Eduardo and Gitanjali to read from their novels. So the last question is, why is it important for you to keep writing? And where do you see your writing taking you? So it is not important for me to keep writing. Um, my way into this party uh, was, was very organic and, and I see my way out of it as organic. Uh, if, 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 if I have nothing else to say, well, I'll stop talking. I have no problem with that. I, I don't consider writing essential to who I am. Um, it's something I do. It's a, it's a craft. Uh, but it's nothing more than that for me, DP. And, and I would say, I don't know about you, Gitanjali, but for me, there's resistance every day. Every day. Every day I sit down in the morning. And every day I have to rekindle the fire. You need that fire to blaze, but that fire goes out uh, at night. And, and, and it's, not, um, it's not easy sometimes. It's, you know, it, it, it's trying to get back to that enthusiasm you had yesterday. It's much easier to go have a cup of coffee. It's much easier to go sit down and read uh, a book, you know, uh, so, so getting past vencer, no, ese, esa, esa resistencia to defeat is not the right word, but, but to, to, to get past it uh, is a daily thing with me. And, and so far, uh, it's been okay. But if it's, if it, one day it doesn't happen, then I'll choose a third profession and, 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 I'll, and I'll do that. I, and the second question, I have no idea where my writing's going. Um, my publishers would love to know. They'd love to know for me to tell them what's the next book, but I honestly don't know. I, 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 I'm working on stories. Uh, there's these ideas that, that present themselves. Um, and, and I just close my eyes and, and, and try to follow and see where that takes me. Um, again, I need to be surprised. I need to be surprised. If not, it, 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 it loses its magic. Uh, it becomes theoretical or, or, or uh, mathematical. And it's not, it shouldn't be in my case. I need the magic. Yeah, yeah. The magic of writing. Mm -hmm. Perhaps um, this is the first time in uh, this present conversation that we are going to say slightly different things. Um, I, I don't give writing uh, that kind of 
a place of sort of glory and importance. I don't, you know, have this kind of um, sense of it being something very weighty. None of that. But it's become very much my way of life. It's become, uh, again, the Hindi word is coming to me, sehaj. Mm. It's just, it, it's just uh, a very sehaj um, act for me, mm. a very natural act for me. It's like breathing. Mm. So I don't see myself giving it up easily. Uh, it'll be wonderful if I can uh, react uh, similarly and say, well, look, I don't have anything else to write. And now I want to go and open a restaurant. I'd like to be, you know, someone like that would go and do something completely different. But as of now, I cannot see myself turning like that. I think it's just too much my breath. And I insist not in a heavy way, also in a playful way, also in a very natural way. So. Uh, writing, um, how do you put the question? I've forgotten. Where do I'm you see your writing? Uh, no, so no, the first part of it. Why was, is it important? For you yeah, so it's writing? just um, important, not because, not because I'm sort of changing the world or, you know, any such grand things, but because it's become my way of breathing. It's, be it's become my way of uh, making sense of the world. It's become my way of conversing with myself. It's become my way of looking at this, you know, great puzzle all around me and putting all those points and, you know, joining them up and making a shape here and a shape here and enjoying it. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it goes on like that mm -hmm. as of now and perhaps for some time still. Mm -hmm. Uh, the second part of it, where do I see my writing take um, taking you, taking me? Um, I think I really don't know because uh, I think the times we are living in are so uncertain. I, especially the last few years and the way the world has changed and the way everything's kind of upside down. I don't know. Uh, everything seems so ominous, so I don't know really where um, my writing would take me, where writing would be, where I would be. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I mean, whatever uh, it, whatever is happening, I think I'll still be writing. That is very reassuring, yeah. and I hope you will keep writing and not give up so soon, because there are, I feel a lot more stories where they came from. Um, uh, but, but I don't think it would be a giving up. I think it would be a, a, a transition to something. Yeah, different, finding a different if something thing. else makes me more enthusiastic, and yeah. so I'll do that. But no, no, I wouldn't see it as giving up. Yeah. Thank you. Well, with this, I end my questions, and I would invite both of you to read from uh, your novels. Um, Gitanjali will read, read to us from the Tomb of Sam, which has just been shortlisted for Booker. And Eduardo was going to read from Cancion, Duelo, Cancion? Cancion. Cancion. Okay. So, Gitanjali? No, I won't get up. No getting up. Not now. The bundle wrapped in the quilt mumbled. No, no, not now. Not getting up. These words alarmed them, and her children grew more insistent. They were afraid. Oh, our dear mother. Papa's gone and he's taken her with him. Stop sleeping so much. Please get up. She keeps sleeping. She just lies there, eyes closed, back to them, they whisper. When Papa was alive, she had put her all into looking after him. She was alert, at the ready, no matter how tired, busy getting ground to a pulp, very much alive, irritable, upset, coping, faltering, breathing breath after breath after breath. Everyone's breath flowed through her and she breathed everyone's breath. And now she's saying she won't get up, as though Papa was her only reason for living. Now he's gone. Has her reason too? No, Ma, no, the children insisted. Look outside. The sun is shining. Get up. Pick up the cane. It's hanging right here. Try some roasted rice. It has peas in it. Maybe she has loose motions. Give her a digestive powder. No, I will not. No, 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 ma mules. She's tired, poor thing, alone and defeated. Lift her up, get her involved, entertain her. Sympathy flows from them, immeasurable, as the waters of the Ganga washing over ma's back. 
not now. Ma tries to scream, but her voice comes out a whimper. Did Ma think that all her children's efforts to make her live were pushing her into the wall? Was that it? When footsteps neared the room, she'd turn her back. She'd stick to the wall. She'd play dead. Eyes and nose closed, ears shut, mouth sewn, mind numb, desires extinct, her bird flown. But the children were also stubborn. They dug in. How to make eyes, nose, ears grow on that back? It was all the same old, same old to her. Same squabbling and squalling. Same fire, fuel and flour. Same wash the diapers. No, no, she repeated. Here was no machination. Her words, machine-like. A machine winding down. A worn-out mechanism. In the languor of conserving energy, she mumbled weakly, no, no, no. No, not getting up any more. Just a few words, but they alarmed the children. Ma is dying. Words. But what are words, really? Hmm? They're mere sounds with meanings dangling from them. They have no logic. They find their own way. Arising from the squabble between a sinking body and a drowning mind, they grab hold of antonyms. The seed planted was a date tree. What blossomed was hibiscus. They wrestle with themselves, wrapped up in their own game. No, now I won't get up. Who was playing with the fear and death of that phrase? These mechanical words became magical and Ma kept repeating them. But they were becoming something else or already had. An expression of true desire or the result of aimless play. No, no, I won't get up. No, I won't rise now. No rising now. New rise new. Now rise new. Now I'll rise anew. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Eduardo. I, I, uh, I changed my mind. Okay. Okay. Do I know? Duelo. Oh, you're right. From something else. No, no. I'll read from, from Duelo instead okay. of Cancion, if that's okay, Lippi, just because. Yeah, yeah, of uh, course, of course. So I'm going to read something very, very short, even shorter, mm -hmm. uh, because I want to talk a little bit about it first. So I'll just read, um, talk, and then read. So Duelo, morning in English. Duelo in Spanish has two meanings. It, it, it means to mourn, but it also means to duel. Uh, and, and both of these meanings are really important in, in the novel. And in every other language, we haven't been able to do that. So every publisher has had to choose which meaning they want. And in English, we went with mourning. So mourning, I was in Guatemala 2015, August 2015, and I was having a, a, a glass of wine with my father. And I asked him a little bit about Salomon. So Salomon would have been his older brother, but he died uh, as a kid. Uh, and I was asking him and he was sort of telling me and not telling me and, and he didn't know much or he didn't want to say much. Uh, and then he said, as I was leaving, he said, but please don't write anything about this. And of course, the first thing I did that night was write this page. I had no idea uh, where it was headed, um, but I just liked this page. I liked this, this paragraph. I liked the sound of it. I liked the music of it. And that's why I think I'll read it because I've been talking about the music of language. Um, I liked the feeling of it. There's this, it has this biblical feel that I immediately was drawn into. Um, and that's very rare for me, Gitanjali, for the first th thing I write to remain the first thing of the story. It usually, usually wind up scrapping it and then go this, but here it actually remained the first page. So I'll, I'll, I'll read that if that's okay. It's very short. His name was Salomon. He died when he was five years old drowned in Lake Amatitlan. That's what they told me when I was a boy in Guatemala. 
that my father's older brother, my grandparents' firstborn, who would have been my uncle Salomon, had drowned in Lake Amatitlan in an accident when he was the same age as me, and that they'd never found his body. We used to spend every weekend at my grandparents' house on the lake shore, and I couldn't look at the water without imagining the lifeless body of Salomon suddenly appearing. I always imagined him pale and naked, and always floating face down by the old wooden dock. My brother and I had even invented a secret prayer, which we'd whisper on the dock, and which I can still recall, before diving into the lake, as if it were a kind of magic spell, as if to banish the ghost of boy Salomon, in case the ghost of boy Salomon was still swimming around. I didn't know the details of the accident, nor did I dare to ask. No one in the family talked about Salomon. No one even spoke his name. So I, I wrote that short paragraph, um, knowing also that I was stepping into mind territory because I was going to have to write a story that no one in my family wanted told. Um, but I, I kept going. Thank you, Edward. <laughs> Regrettably, we have to end this very interesting conversation that we were having. But I hope Dr. Pujol and Marty, we can have another occasion in which we gather and we talk about because there's so many things yet to be. We've just touched the surface. But thank you so much, Eduardo, and thank you, Gitanjali, for thank giving you. us your time and sharing your thoughts so openly with us. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.